Welcome to PPA Expert. My name is Tom and I'll be presenting the Human Performance and Limitations course. This course is designed to give you an in-depth understanding on the theory required to pass the CAA theory exam for this particular topic. Despite this, own self-study, commitment and discipline will be required. The course is displayed in the form of a slideshow, which I'll be talking through. Please feel free to pause the recording at any point to either take a break or write down any notes. So the overview of this subject, uh, the subjects that we are going to be looking at in some more detail are the body, health, the mind, crew management and cockpit design. So the first topic we're going to look at is the body. The nervous system. Okay, so uh, within the human body we uh, have something called a nervous system and it's basically the control center uh, which processes nerve impulses. Okay, uh, the body relies on this nervous system to completely function. There's three main systems within the nervous system. So the first one is the central nervous system, otherwise known as the CNS, and this analyzes the data uh, from the senses all over the body, and the physical parts of the central nervous system are the spinal cord, so running down the spine, and also the brain. Then we have the peripheral nervous system, and these are the that system that passes information from the central nervous system to the organs. Okay, so it's a passageway passing information between the two different elements. And lastly, we've got the autonomic nervous system. Okay, this nervous system manages the glands within the body, so it manages our temperature, uh, how much we're sweating, our body temperature, how um, hot or cold we want to be, and it can regulate that temperature by sweating, uh, trying to release some of that heat. So the second part of the body we're going to look at is the respiratory system. Okay, and the process of respiration is transporting uh, oxygen into the body, and then the gas, the waste gas released, is also part of that process. The waste gas which is released is carbon dioxide. So air is brought into the lungs, so it's where the air accumulates, and it's brought in via the nose or the mouth. Okay, either or can uh, let air in or out. And inside the lungs is where that gas exchange takes place. So it's a network of airways where the gas mixes together and uh, the, the lungs can absorb the oxygen uh, once the air has been uh, breathed in. So now we're going to look at the lungs in a bit more detail. And uh, within the lungs in the body, we have two of them. Uh, we have something called alve alveolus. And that's where the oxygen is diffused into the blood, okay, via the alve alveolar wall. And from there, it's where the oxygen is then carried to the cells, okay. So the body can function, and that's the way it does it, okay. Once that oxygen has been uh, used up by the certain cells within the body, that blood uh, returns to the lungs as carbon dioxide, and then it's exhaled. Uh, via the nose or the mouth as uh, the waste gas. So the next part of the body we're going to be looking at is the heart. And the heart is the centre of the circulatory system, pumping blood around the body. Okay, so it's a pump, it pumps the blood to the extremities of the body and all around. So what can go wrong with the heart? So it's a system, so either the heart could stop working or the veins and arteries could get clogged and that could cause a fault. Also blood is unable to carry enough oxygen for the needs of the tissue. Okay, So if the, if the heart stops working as well then not enough, uh, we can't get enough oxygen to the different uh, organs within the body and that's where we could uh, encounter something called hypoxia which we'll look at later on in the slideshow. Most issues that occur from heart issues or failure uh, can be prevented by um, a couple of ways. So firstly, smoking is a large contributor to heart system failure. And also eating healthy and exercising often will minimize the risk of any heart uh, issues or heart related issues.
So within blood, we have something called hemoglobin. It's found in the red blood cells, and its job is to carry oxygen to the lungs and around the rest of the body. So it's effectively a carrier of oxygen. Hemoglobin has approximately 210 times the affinity bond with carbon monoxide than it does oxygen. Okay, so what that means is if there was carbon monoxide pre present in the atmosphere, the carbon monoxide is much more likely to bond with the red blood cells, which will therefore carry it around the body than oxygen would. Okay, so that's why we need to be uh, wary if there is carbon monoxide around, and we'll have a talk about that later on the effects and how to avoid. Um, uh, issues if we are exposed to carbon monoxide. The regulation of the respiratory system, so effectively how quickly we're breathing in and out, is regulated by the level of carbon monoxide in the blood, so that's uh, the waste gas. So as our respiratory system senses more carbon dioxide, uh, so more waste gas, it more oxygen is needed to displace the carbon dioxide. Okay, so if we have more waste gas, our breathing rate will increase. Eventually, if we don't get rid of enough of this waste gas, our breathing rate will continue to a point where hyperventilation would occur. And we'll have a look at that next, what hyperventilation is. So what is hyperventilation, otherwise known as breathing rate? Okay, so it's the overbreathing, a condition where a sufferer who is suffering from hyperventilation may breathe in more deeply and more rapidly than is required. Okay, so they've got an excessive breathing rate, more than is needed. Now hyperventilation uh, normally uh, occurs because there is a need for more oxygen. However, there are some factors that can also onset hyperventilation, such as stress and anxiety. They could be trigger factors for hyperventilation and ultimately calming someone down uh, from the stress and anxiety may help to alleviate any symptoms that are present. Okay, So generally, uh, keeping people calm and um, calming them down after a stressful or some uh, situation where they're exposed to a lot of anxiety will normally uh, deal with hyperventilation. But we'll look on the next slide, um, the causes, symptoms, and the best way of dealing with it. So as discussed previously, hyperventilation occurs when the body overbreathes and as a result of psychological distresses generally. Okay, it's the causing of uh, having breathlessness, so you can't catch your breath. Um, that's what hyperventilation is. So some of the causes we've already looked at: stress and anxiety, how they could be a trigger factor. Any environmental factors such as vibration or turbulence, high G load if we're doing aerobatics. If we have some pre-existing health issues or mo even some motion sickness, all of these could be a trigger for hyperventilation. Some of the symptoms you might feel when uh, exposed to hyperventilation, so we could feel dizzy as we're not getting enough oxygen into the, the body. Tingling in the feet or the hands as not enough uh, oxygen is getting to the extremities of the body. Tunnel vision, so our vision goes a little bit blurry and instead of having a large peripheral vision, we just see a small segment in front of us. Any hot or cold sensations, flushes, so either the body feels really warm or the body feels really cold. And ultimately, if not uh, dealt with appropriately, uh, you could become unconscious. So how do we deal with hyperventilation? Well, I said on the previous slide, we want to calm people down. So try talking to them, try and alleviate that stress and anxiety. And by talking to someone, that can slow down their breathing rate. Breathing in and out of a paper bag will help increase the carbon dioxide in the blood, which means that the, the breathing rate uh, will decrease. If ultimately we don't see any recover from any of these symptoms, if we try to deal with them, then we can assume hypoxia is the problem, and then we'll take a different course of action, and we'll look at that slightly later on. So now we're going to have a look at some atm atmospheric pressure. So as our altitude increases above sea level, the pressure of the air decreases. So effectively the weight above us uh, decreases. As we get closer to the ground, our pressure increases. So the pressure at, of air at any given point in the atmosphere 
can be viewed as by having a weight above it. Okay, so as we go higher, there's less weight. As we go lower, there's more. As we increase altitude, there are fewer air molecules above you than that at the ground. Okay, so the best way of uh, describing this is if we had a cubic air, cubic meter of air on the ground uh, at sea level, there would be, you know, a substantial amount of air molecules as we go further up in the atmosphere for the same given amount of air um, there'll be less air molecules okay so as we go up in altitude pressure decreases so even though the pressure decreases and there's effectively less air molecules, the composition of the atmosphere still remains the same. So it's 78% nitrogen, 20% of oxygen. So that always stays at the same. So because there's air, less air molecules, uh, the higher we go, the less oxygen there is. Okay, that means um, we cannot get enough oxygen in us as we go up in altitude which is simply because uh, there, is, there are less air molecules, so it's harder to get enough for to, enough air molecules to do the, the action that we want to do. Okay, So if we do find ourselves at altitude uh, without any kind of uh, subsequent um, way of dealing with the lack of oxygen, we could have uh, some symptoms to see that uh, we are suffering from something called hypoxia. So some of the symptoms are impaired judgment, so you can't think clearly about what's going on, some kind of confusion, headache or dizziness, loss of coordination, drowsiness, cyanosis, so your skin starts going blue or grey, eventually we'll start to hyperventilate as the body requires more oxygen. Then we'll lose senses, so vision normally goes first and then ultimately unconsciousness and death if we still cannot get enough oxygen. Okay, So it's important that we, if we do start dealing with these uh, or feeling some of these symptoms that we deal with it in the, the best manner and harmony manner as possible. So as we go up in the atmosphere, um, as I mentioned before, there's less air molecules of oxygen. Okay, So the higher we go, the more oxygen uh, is required because there is less of it, and ultimately if we don't get that sub subsequent um, addition of oxygen, then um, the previous symptoms could occur. Okay, so the altitude we're at will return something known as the time of useful consciousness. So if we go back to the previous slide, one of the last things that could happen if we don't get oxygen is unconsciousness and death. Okay, so depending on what altitude we're at, if we're not uh, supplemented with additional oxygen, that's the time at which if uh, we will or unconsciousness will occur. Okay, so we look at the table at the bottom right, we'll see at 22,000 feet, if we're subjected to um, no additional oxygen and to the atmos atmospheric uh, pressure with that outside of an aircraft, then we've got between 5 and 10 minutes until unconsciousness will uh, in uh, set in. Okay, as you see, if we go up in altitude, that time reduces all the way up to 40 to 45,000 feet. We've just got a matter of seconds between 5 and 15 seconds uh, before we would become unconsciousness, as there's so little oxygen that high up in the atmosphere. Okay, so how do we deal with it? Well, to avoid hypoxia and then not have this issue of time of useful consciousness, if we're flying over 10,000 feet, then we need to be flying with oxygen masks so that supplements re-oxygen to account for the fact that uh, we don't have it within the atmosphere around us or we need to be flying within an aircraft that is pressurized okay so a pressurized aircraft is one that can regulate the inflow and the outflow of the pressure and so therefore um, there's a there's a greater amount of oxygen molecules within the aircraft so we won't suffer from hypoxia if that aircraft was to lose pressure for whatever reason which occasionally does happen then depending on the altitude you're at will determine how long you've got your time of useful consciousness um, if before you put an oxygen mask on that supplementary oxygen. So carbon monoxide is a byproduct of the internal combustion engine. Okay, so what's released out the exhaust of an engine. So as we saw previously, it has affinity much greater than oxygen to the blood. 
So if we are exposed to an atmosphere that has carbon monoxide with it, with it such as inside an aircraft, then obviously this could be detrimental to our health. Okay. Uh, 